hopefully, of one of your leaders <coughs> in one of these sections. How are you now knowing this? So take that leader from stage one to stage two, or from here to here, or from here to here. What challenges, opportunities do you need to implement? to lead them through that leadership panel. Or if you, the leader, are training everyone like this, which leader do you need to release some autonomy to, ask some questions of, communicate, find out more from, delegate, so that they will not be frustrated by your school leadership. Hmm? That's the real application of this, right? So looking at, okay, I've got some leaders that are coming in here, you might have seven names here, depending on how big your departments and your teams and the people that you're leading are. You might have 10 names here, 20 names there, five names there, you can leave on this here. So you go, okay, well, hmm, I've got five people that I can, I've delegated and I just need a monthly report from, you know, but it's not a daily report from. But there are some people that can go into this category. You know, what do I need to do to move them from here to here? What do I need to challenge them with? What do I need to change? What structure do I need to implement? Do you understand? Because we're trying to get the best out of these people, give them the leadership that they were created to, to be, the destiny that God has for them. But we are the ones that bring out the best in there that is the application of this now if you haven't got a leadership team underneath you you're going well one day okay keep that for one day but if you do let's look at how we progress people who can go to the next level all right which leader has been committed and have learned the skills and are willing and able to Go to another level. Can we promote that person? How do we promote that person? These are the questions, all right? What do we need to do to promote that person? When we were looking, literally, when we're looking for our next campus, you know, Banana was praying, and who is the person that is in faithful, who can lead people, who can speak and vision, who can organize services, who have been there for the years, who have got our culture, who know how to protect Sharon and my dad, who are into God's word. And so we're literally looking at, you know, all these people that are in this category. So now this is a huge step up. Who's willing, who can? And we realize, God, highlight, highlight, highlight. And ta-da! Heidi, not Rob. <laughs> Rob and Heidi, actually, it's like this. They were there all the time. They were there all the time. They've been with us for 10 years. They've been faithful, they know this, they've met that, they've seen this, they've gone through this tough situation, they know our, our story, they know our culture, they're here every week. And you go, oh, tick, 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 Lord. What do you think? Yes, cool. Let's move them from here to here. Now, to be honest, it doesn't just end like this, because they're about to get here. Mm. <laughs> so in every cycle, every promotion, you go from this big dog to back here. So now they're going to be around this table of Kansas pastors, and some of the Kansas pastors have been doing it for ages, you know, and Rob and Heidi are going to be, okay, no, no, Rob, that's not what you say. You don't swear at each other on the microphone. You know, you can't talk like they don't do that, you know? So if you can't do that, Rob, Rob, you can't wear your kilt to church every Sunday. <laughs> you know, you can't do that, Rob. Your knees, you know, you're causing the, the people to stumble, you know? And so I'm going to some direction, right? And then after they're doing it for a while, I don't want to be telling Rob, Rob, when you get up there, you need to say this, or you need to wear that, or you need to improve this. After a time, you go, Rob, great. Can you coach the following campus? We're looking at three new interns. Can you start coaching them to run services? Can you start, you know? And then after a while, he's doing this part for other leaders, right? So we just need to understand that this cycle is really continuous. I become the state president, you know, I got a national executive, 
you know, and we're just constantly learning. It's not a bad thing, but hopefully we're learning and we've got leaders above us that are drawing it out of us and we are serving, showing our willingness, commitment to be teachable, humble, to build something together. Is that okay? Good questions. I like questions. Yes. Oh, we have to be a couple. What if I was amazing? Heidi was so amazing, and you did the not so much. Heidi, I can't stand the stuff. Yeah. Well, okay. So, once again, there seems to be a common thing. I'm so excited to see you. I don't know. I think you did a sandwich. I would say. Okay. Um, it depends. So, what did we say? You look at the person. And you look at the complexity of the task. Yeah. Okay. So, can a single woman or a single man lead a campus? And the answer for me would be absolutely. Now, another church if I get no. If, 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 for me, even if the husband never gets up on stage and leads from the stage, the men need to see husband and wife because that's how we build family here at Central Point Church. Now, it doesn't mean she can't preach. It doesn't mean she can't lead. It doesn't mean, do you know what I mean? But I, I need a husband and wife, a father and mother at every campus when Shan and I are not there so that they can reproduce and speak into their fathers and mothers everywhere. That's me. Other churches say, no, nah, all single, great. A lot of uni churches. Man, they're all single people. Look at the task. Look at the, the task. Look at the people. They've only got single people and they're reaching out to 90% single people. Why not? Yes, absolutely. Right? So for us, campus pastors probably need to be under the age of 65 because they're setting up and backing up the task. They need to motivate people so the drop just gets in. Right? And they need to be a couple because there are certain things that the, the wife will need to do to gather the women. Certain times the husband will need to gather the men. There's certain times that there's a marriage issue that we need a husband and wife together to speak into. You know, uh, there might be a sexual issue. I never, I never ever speak to women about sexual issues, ever. It's just law in our church. Sharon or Taryn or uh, Heidi will need to or Eudora will need to or we just make sure that we have the voice of the father and the voice of the mother always, right? Now, we've got people in our church that the woman is an awesome woman of God, the husband doesn't follow the Lord. She can do everything. She can be an elder. She can be a board member. She can preach the word of God. But when it comes to the campus pastor, because of the way you structured our church, the campus pastors are not the senior pastor, but three out of four weeks and in the future five weeks, they will be. Four out of five weeks or three out of four weeks, they are the representative of the senior pastors because the senior pastor can't be at that campus three out of four or four out of five when we pass the next campus and so what we need to do is have that model there that we have husband and wife does that make sense okay. but we've got some we've got two single godly on fire women that are on our board esther lim and jess barrett they're you know, high in business world, they love the house of God, they serve the help song lead, lead on stage, they would speak, they're on our board, nothing disqualifying them. I just would need them to be married. I would. The next senior pastor of Center Point Church might say, no, we can have everybody. And um, so that's just more a personal thing. So once again, they might be ready. And I might be the limiting factor by saying, no, 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 you have to be married to be a campus pastor. Mm -hmm. But what I would say to them, and they can't say to me, well, that's a round peg in a square hole. No, no, that's what we're doing. But what can you do? You can preach. 
you can lead, you can be on our board, you can run a connect group, you can serve in this area, you can be a department, there's all this you can do, but there's a few things you won't be able to do. Does that help? Yes. Good. Question? That's right. That's right. No, that's not the truth. No, that's, that's not, not right. I'm only checking. That's not right. Our, our, youth, not right. our, youth, our youth pastors, I'm okay with them being single. Our, our, because they're dealing with singles, you know, but I just think in, in the, the senior leadership of that campus, not only do they need to be married, but they need to have strong marriages. That's the other thing. So, okay. Hey? The bar is set very high. The bar is set very high, but that's what one Timothy and Titus both tells us, that he needs to be the husband of one wife. You know, that he has a good reputation, he's not given to wine, he's not a given to rage, his children serve the Lord. All those requirements are actually in um, the role of a senior leader. So, yeah, the bar is high. Daniel, is that a question or is that just the moment? Yeah, no, no, it, <laughs> the it, was, it was a question. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting. It sounds like a lot of pressure. I mean, on a, on a marriage as well, to sort of like, because if the marriage has to be strong to be in your position, and the moments when, because marriage is strong, but then you also go through ups and downs. I've heard, haven't been there. <laughs> nah. This is what I've heard. So what do you do in those moments of weakness where, where things aren't going well? Do you? Oh, look, it's not a perfect marriage. It's a strong marriage. What does that mean? That Christ is the center of the marriage, number one. That we are committed to work through anything and everything together. You know, there'll be seasons where we will need to get counseling. There'll be seasons where we need to invite our elders and our oversight to speak into our life, pray with us, stand with us. I'm not saying that it's a great marriage all the time. I'm saying it's a strong marriage and you build strong marriages. They don't just happen. They build when you apply the word of God, when you're committed to each other for your rest of your life till death do you part, you know, and that Jesus is that third chord. So that's what I mean. It doesn't mean that I don't annoy Sharon. She doesn't annoy me, that there's seasons where we're working through stuff, you know, but that is a requirement. It actually is a requirement, you know, and so we put rules in place to help us. It's not like a burden. I've got to get my marriage right. You know what? If I wasn't a pastor, I need to get my, <laughs> that's my first priority. The church is a byproduct. As I was sharing with you guys there, my first church is my wife. My second church is my immediate family. My third church is called Center Point. So if my first church is struggling because I'm giving all my attention to my third church, I've got my priorities wrong. So I don't go, oh, to, in order to please my third church, I'm gonna have to work on my first church. You know what I mean? That's not it, it's the overflow. And that's what Paul was saying. Hey, listen, make sure your households are running well. Make sure your marriage is doing well. Then you can lead other people by showing them how to run their own families. Can you imagine if Sharon and I weren't talking together, if our marriage was messed up, and you have a marriage problem and you come and see your pastor? How do I speak into your life? How do I challenge you to change? Right? So these are important. That's why Paul says... It doesn't say you have to be perfect because we are so far from perfect, but we do have to have a stable foundation that is Christ Jesus. Commitment to each other that we're willing to work through everything. We've gone on seeing counsellors. We've had people pray for us. We've had one-on-one -on -one counselling with our key leaders and, and confession times and dealing with stuff. That's a normal part of life, you know, but there's this commitment that we're going to build a healthy life together. Does that answer that question? Yeah. And I do not feel a pressure to be, to have a good marriage. If anything, I feel the pressure of leaving the church. I don't feel the pressure, oh, I've got to be a good dad to Levi, otherwise the church is going to cut me off. That, that's, that's the wrong way of looking at it. I'm like, man, I love my family. God, help me to be a good dad. Oh, yes. And by the way, by doing that, I actually qualify in this particular area to leave the church. Does that help? Yeah.
cool. You guys are asking good questions. I think he's stolen the gold star from the two of you. So, well done. Okay, let's do the next session in 20 minutes. Mario Rexy. We are moving on to the habits of a leader. This one we should all know, but I'm going to run through it anyway. And we are talking about solitude and prayer the habits of a successful christian leader of course we're talking about christian leadership as opposed to secular leadership and so this part is extremely crucial that if you call yourself a christian leader that you have the foundation of god's word and a prayer life functioning and thriving in your life so you're going to give yourself a grade are you ready out of 10 I did this with our staff today. How's your prayer life going? Be honest. Jesus is watching. No, you will not have to come up here and tell everybody <coughs> what your grade is. You won't have to share it with anybody. But just be honest. How's your prayer life going? If it's good, you're happy with it, you're getting some good time with the Lord. That's a six, seven, eight, nine. You know, you probably won't reach a 10 this side of heaven. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? If that discipline is dropped and I'm praying, but as I'm going from the bathroom to the toilet, you know, I'm praying, but just before we eat a meal and just before I fall asleep, Lord Jesus, thank you, God. All right? That, that's a one, two, three, right? Uh, because that means you don't actually have devoted time. Devoted time. See, I come home every day and I talk to Sharon. Hi, honey, how's your day? Good. How's your day? Good. What happened? Da, 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 da. Right? I, I, at the same time, I might be on my phone. I might be turning the TV on. She might be cooking dinner. I might be helping a kid with her homework. That's not devoted time. That's a conversation. And we should be praying every single day before we eat, on the way to the bathroom, on the, you know, before we jump in the car, whatever. We should constantly be praying without ceasing, the Bible talks about, right? But that's not devoted time. Once a week, Friday night usually, is date night. The boys go to youth group, Sharon and I go out together, we may dress up a little bit. This is date night. We go to a restaurant, we go out. This is me and her, no one else. There's no phone, there's no children. Tell me about you, help me to reconnect with you. You reconnect with me. This is how you build, by the way, a good marriage, uh, Daniel, uh, that you set devoted time, right? That's what I'm talking about, prayer. I'm not talking about your walking past Jesus as you're waiting for the bus, but do you have devoted time? Is it in your calendar? You just lost a couple of points, didn't you? <laughs> You're like, I'm a seven. Isn't it, Alan? I'm a four. <laughs> Devoted time. Remember, I said to you with our strategic plan, I have a vision to be like this with Jesus. And you break it down, it's not in my calendar. All right? It's got to be in your calendar, or it needs to be a regular place, a regular time. Because you go, oh, I'll just fit it in wherever. Well, guess what? You won't. Something will steal that time. Something will steal that place. And uh, we don't want that. So, um, it's so important that we're having that devotional time set, up, set aside for God. Um, I think it was Martin Luther who said, I have too much to do in a day for me not to start with three hours of prayer. I was like, ooh. <laughs> but he goes, I just got too much to do in the day that for me not to start with three hours of prayer. Okay? And it was a real challenge to me going, God, it's not about how long you pray. It's not about how religious you are. Please don't, you know, mishear me. This is not a legalistic, performance-based, yes, tick the sheep. But yeah, this right. is a devotional relationship with the Lord. And unless it's in your calendar on a daily basis, something will take that place. Right? We all know it. It could be Facebook. It can be work. It can be sport. It can be your car. It can be your family. But he's got to be your priority. So out of 10, 
I would love you to answer that question. Here's the next one. How often would you read the Word of God a week? Out of 10. <laughs> Out of 10. In fact, we'll make it easy. Out of 10. Each day you read your Bible a week on average, give yourself two points. Sorry, same thing here. Each day you read your Bible, right? Give yourself two points. So if you read five times a week, that's 10 out of 10. If you read seven days a week, that's 14 out of 10. Yeah, 14 out of 10. Okay? Here's the next one. How often would you pray in the Spirit each week? For longer than, let's put in a little stipulation. For longer than one minute. Oh, no one's getting any points. Okay, next one. Next one. How often, or out of 10, rate your Bible journal revelation out of 10? Writing it down. Because we all know, I read something this morning. Cool. What was it? I don't know. I can't remember that. Right? Reading something doesn't stay in. You need to read. You need to meditate, you need to think upon, you need to write, you need to pray. That's how you get revelation out of the scriptures. So some of you go, well, I've read my chapter for the day. That's not getting revelation out of the word. Do you know the SOAP principle? SOAP? S-O-A-P? You better know. You too or you're out of the class. Out in a loud voice? Application and prayer. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. So, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. You read however much you want to read for the day. Just say you read John chapter 3, right? As you're reading it, you are watching for what the Holy Spirit will highlight. Just say, after reading all of John chapter 3, John 3, 16 jumps out of it. I'm just doing that because all of you <laughs> should know that scripture. For God so love the world, okay? Therefore, Write it. Write out the scripture for God. So love. Oh, why do we need to do it? It's already in my Bible. No, no, no. We're meditating. As we're writing, we're rethinking. We're pondering for God. So love the world that He gave. So I need to write the whole thing out. That scripture. First part, tip. Observation. What is it saying? All right that our God so loved humanity that he was willing to generously sacrifice his only son. Wow. Okay. That's what it means to me. So then you write down the observation. Okay. Uh, my God, you know, blah, blah, blah. Da, da, da. Application. This, how does this affect me? Die. Yeah, what? that's a challenge. Would I be willing to love someone like that? Or, or this love was for me. He chose me over his son. Not because he doesn't love his son, but he was willing to do that for me. This love, the application of Joel, this love is for you. All right, that's what when I'm, when I'm thinking about this, I really is slam, hit me in the face. This love is for you. Finish off with prayer. Father, help me to understand the depth of your 
love. Thank you, God. Yeah, or thank you, God. Whatever the prayer is that's coming out of your heart. Then, even if you forget everything you read in John 3, John chapter 3, when you look through your journals, you will have a meditated scripture that you've got revelation from. So then, if I say to you, I'm going to give you guys five minutes and then I want somebody to come up here and share something from the Word of God. You can just quickly go to your phone and go, well, my reading this week. In fact, I don't even need to remember that. It's John 3.16. I know I'm reading John 3. But the bit that stood out to me was, that's right, he gave his son, he loves me, and man, it blew me apart and I prayed that he's now been working for my spirit so I can share in and out of season about the love of God because that's what God's been speaking to me about. This is important. This is discipleship. Because just reading the word alone is not enough. We were never called to read God's word. We were called to meditate on God's word. Isn't that true? We were called to obey God's word and act on it. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So you're going to be talking about it. You shall meditate on it. Think over it so that you be careful to do according to all that's written in it. All right, speak it, think it, do it, and what will be the byproduct of that? For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. If you want to be a successful leader, you want to be a successful or successful husband, father, wife, anything, you must read the word, you must speak the word, you must meditate on the word, you must apply the word. And this is how simple way that you can apply to your life. I would love it for all of you. Next week, you're going to give me a number of soap you did this week. You maximum of five because you've got five fingers on one hand. All right. I'm going to ask you how many soap did you do? This should take you 10 to 15 minutes. Don't look like this is too much work. Devotion is a part of your biblical discipleship every day you should be getting into your word and you should be able to write this out within 10 minutes on your phone write it out this scripture god spoke to me about then i'm going to say all right hands up how many devotions soaps did you do this week you're going to go one and i'll go pray for that person two three four five right we do this with our thursday morning group they all every day every week sorry they show us how many fingers over Zoom and we check it out. Then, come on, well done. Let's keep encouraging each other to get into the Word of God. This is important. This is crucial. This is important. This is crucial that your life be founded in the Word of God. Mick, you want to say something? I'll scratch my back. I'll scratch your back. Okay. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Okay. So, yes. Sorry. Bye. Some of the some scriptures that you read, it's very hard to find an application. So I was just wondering, is the application always a thing that we might find when we read scripture? Absolutely. Otherwise, what's the point? So keep reading until a scripture jumps out. The Holy Spirit is bringing something to light highlighting something he actually wants to change you so what is it so you might read isaiah 40 cool which verse is the holy spirit highlighting and then you go okay well holy spirit tell me what what why 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 can't i move past this why is this drawing my attention what is it saying how does it apply to me lord help me and rather than just speed reading through your chapter for the day, you're being spirit-led in your discipleship. Okay? So one example, I'm going to show you through uh, one example that I did this week that I'm sharing with you today. And I shared stuff this morning because we're talking about Bible reading and prayer being the cornerstone of leadership successful leadership as Christian leaders in this particular session is Matthew chapter 6. Verse 7 and 8. And I'm going to do this in eight minutes. So I'm going to read it to you very quickly. Jesus said, sorry, verse 
6, 9 to 13, not 7, 8, 9 to 13. He says, then this is how you should pray, Jesus speaking. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all the Catholics can help me. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, how many of you read that a million times? All right, how many of you said it a million times? Okay, so what can happen when you're reading scripture? I read this, I read this passage at least a hundred times in my life. I've probably preached on this passage at least 20 times. So what do I do? Lord, I'm reading this passage again. Open my eyes. Spirit, lead me. And this time as I read it, I realized something just jumped out of me. And that is this. Give us today our daily bread. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that. Give us today our daily bread. So I'm like, look, read it again. Holy Spirit speaking to me. I don't know what he's saying. So God, give me some clarity. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today what I need. Give us, give me my needs. God, you know my needs. Give me my needs. And the Holy Spirit said, this is the only line of the prayer where you ask God for material things. But the prayer is so much longer. And have you been praying wrongly? Because when I go to God for prayer, I'm not asking for, God, I need help with this. I've got a problem with this area. I need your help with this area. I need your help with this person. I need your help with this thing. Can you meet this thing? Can you meet that thing? Can you meet this? Jesus' name, amen. And we see that in that whole prayer, supplication or asking for what you need, it's just this one little sentence in the middle. And prayer is so much bigger than asking God for what you need. That's the revelation I got. That prayer is probably not what I thought it actually was. Because, in fact, later, earlier in the passage, Jesus says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. Why? For your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. I'm like, heck, my whole prayer life. I've just been asking for stuff. And Father already knows. And I shared this example with our team. My boys, at five o'clock in the evening, as their stomachs start to rumble, don't have to come to Sharon and go, our mother who walks in PR waters, <laughs> right? Can you please give us food for dinner tonight? Can you please think about dinner tonight? Please, I know you can. Can you please meet my name? She already knows, even before their stomach starts to turn, she actually purchased the stuff before the week began. She planned the menu. She planned her day of when to cook it so that dinner would be ready when their bodies were hungry. They don't need to even ask. Why? Because she's a good mother. She knows what they need before they ask. And my prayer life has been about asking what I need. And he goes, listen, would you stop babbling on? This is Jesus speaking, paraphrase by George Elia. Would you stop babbling on and asking us for what you need? Well, hold on. You're asking us to pray. Then you're asking us not to ask. You're asking us to pray. But sometimes you're saying, don't even ask to use words. What is prayer? <laughs> Have I been praying wrong this whole time? And then I looked at the scripture. I go, okay, what is prayer? Number one. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Prayer number one is coming into the presence of God with worship and adoration. So what we did this evening, before you pray for each other's needs, we just worship God. That was prayer. So when I asked you, how's your prayer life going? Some of you thought, well, I asked God for the five things I needed for five minutes yesterday so i probably haven't prayed very much but maybe you worshiped maybe you connected your heart with him with adoration 
maybe you exalted him. You know the word, hallowed be your name. Your name is the character in Hebrew culture. So your name represents your character. Holy is your character. So Lord, you are holy. You are amazing. You are big. You are almighty. You are magnificent. You are good. You are kind. That's prayer. Worship and adoration is prayer. There's another part of prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You know what that is? It's surrender. That means all the stuff that's going in my world, I place it at your feet. Every area that I'm struggling with, I give it to you. Lord, in my life, my sexuality, your kingdom come. My marriage, your kingdom come. My finances, your kingdom come. Your will be done. I don't know even what I need. I don't even know what to ask for. I don't even know what the solution for COVID-19 is. But God, I'm saying, this world, your kingdom come. In Australia, your kingdom come. Your will be done. In my household, your kingdom. Not what I want, not what my wife wants. You may be driving me crazy at this point, not what my kids want. But I feel choking maybe at this point. Your kingdom come in my family. Your will be done in my family. What you want, what your word says, that's going to be my priority. I surrender every area to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's prayer. Surrender. Here's the third thing. Give us this day our daily bread. Cool. Move on. He already knows. Keep going. Ask, but keep moving. He goes on to say, and forgive us our debtors. Lord, highlight any wicked way in me, is what David used to say. Show me if there's any ungodliness, any sin in my heart. Show me if there's a wicked way. Do not repent for something the Holy Spirit is not highlighting. Some people out of religion like to confess things that maybe the Holy Spirit is not putting his finger on. But also, they're not making time to ask the Holy Spirit to search his torchlight through your life to highlight some areas that he's asking you not to resist him in. Because what is a sin for some people may not be a sin for you. And what is a sin for you might not be for others. So what we try to do is compare ourselves and justify ourselves. Well, you know what? They can do that. So why can't I? Well, God says, listen, hear my voice. Let me lead you. If I'm saying don't do it, that's a sin. Don't do it. So allow the Holy Spirit to highlight any areas of sin in your life. The next step goes, help me forgive our debtors. Oh, you're basically saying, Lord, search through the extent of all my relationships. Walk around the fence of my life and show me if I've got unforgiveness to my pastor, to my friend, to my wife, to my child. And even when I say, you know what, I'm not offended. I just don't want to talk to that person ever again. Right? Even if I say things like, you know what, I'm not hurt. It's just, I, 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 you know, I'm just saying, I'm just upset. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not bitter. And you know, people will say they're not bitter ask, right? By the way, that's just the best way to say I'm bitter. But we need to allow the Holy Spirit to walk around the boundaries and the relationships of our life and go, hold on, sort this out. Sort this relationship out. That's prayer. We don't do that. This is the least prayer that we pray. We go, oh, I'll just forget about it. I'll just move on. God says, no, you cannot. Before you bring your gift to the altar, go sort it out with your brother. You know that scripture? Because yeah. it blocks your prayer life. And so he goes, invite God. Just search your relationship. Invite God. And then he goes, lead us not into temptation. In other words, bring your weak parts to God. Don't just ask him for the stuff you need. Bring your weak parts. What's your area that you're struggling right now? What's the area that you're tempted with right now? Bring them to the Lord. Don't hide them. Don't pull them back. And the last one is deliver us from evil, which talks about standing in your authority and realizing that the fight that you are fighting is not about flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And you have been given authority and spiritual weapons over set territory. I have an authority over my wife to 
pray over her and break anything that can come against her. I've got authority over my children. I've got an authority over our pastors and leaders. I've got an authority over my church. I've got authority over the state. I've got to stand in that gap and realize that before I can do anything out there, before I can change that rebellious child, before I can punish that rebellious child, I need to deal with the spirit of rebellion in prayer, right? And pray the protection of God that says, you know what? Deliver us from evil. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Start to stand and declare that the territory that the Lord has given us will see victory in an open heaven. Begin to pray that way. Change my whole prayer life. Because if you even did half of this, you're going to spend ages in the presence of God. And it's not about a tick list. Pray for mom. Okay, pray for mom. Pray for dad. Okay, pray for dad. Pray for the three boys. Well, just the boys. Pray for the boys. <laughs> I'm done in three minutes. Right? But God says, come on, I want you on a journey. That's an example of a soap. Right? So I would write here the whole of Matthew 6, 8, plus my observation. Don't spend so much time asking. What's my application? I need to start developing the worship part. I need to start developing the inviting him into forgiveness part. I need to invite him into my relationship. I need to stand my ground and begin to pray the protection of God over every area. And then I say, Lord, help me battle this. That's a soap. Soap, prayer, foundation of successful Christian leadership. With three minutes over time, we're going to pray. Stand to your feet so you don't fall asleep. <laughs> I know it's getting late, and I know this is a bit of a pet passion. And for one, two, three of you, you've heard this message this uh, afternoon in staff. Thank you for being so patient. But this is something for here and now. All right? Would you just begin to pray in that heavenly tongue? All right. Okay. Come on, let me hear you. Begin to activate your spirit. Begin to activate your spirit language. Come on, yes, let's begin to pump that pump. Robo sotur da bakanda da bashanda la da bakando. Robo shundo lo do bashanda la da kanda la da bakanda. Robo bobo shotar da bashanda la kanda la la. Come on, lose yourself in that language. Robo shanda la spirit spirit. Robo kutar da bashanda la da kando la da kanda. La kanda la bashanda la. Oh, and the violence take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence take it by force. Father, I pray for a spirit of prayer and intercession, Father, on every one of these men and women. Lord God, fresh devotion, fresh hearing of your voice, fresh reading of revelation and spending time in your word. I pray for the pouring of your spirit. I pray for a spirit of intercession to be imparted into these men and these women and their ground, and to pray, Father God, and to see the strongholds of the enemy broken in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for breakthroughs in their mountains and breakthroughs in their families and breakthroughs, Lord God, in their houses, in their workplaces. Father, we don't ask for what we need because you know, but we take authority over every work of the enemy now. In the name of Jesus, and we bind up the lies of the enemy, and we bind up the work of the enemy, and we release your presence. We declare, let your kingdom come. We declare, let your will be done here on earth in my life now. Oh, Rabbi Shanda Lakanda, fresh fire for us, fresh fire for Kuma, right now, Father God, fresh fire into the of their soul. 
Hussein and Cosmo and Nick, Lord God, fresh fire, Lord God, as the husband and the father, Lord, I pray. Father, for our ladies, Narelle and Shemitai and Joe and Maria, Lord God, right now, I pray for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I pray for your oil now. I pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Father God, and Narelle, Lord, I thank you for Desiree and Daniel. Lord God, for Zach and Calvin. I thank you, Father God, that you're setting them apart. A single people, Lord, to run after you wholeheartedly. Father, I break up every distraction. I break up everything that would cause them to stumble. Lord God, that they be fire, that they run in a fire of holiness, a fire of devotion to the Lord. I pray for them right now. Come on, give me a big kiss to heaven, a big kiss of praise, a big kiss of worship. Let your praise and your embrace go up to God with everything within you. We worship you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Awesome. Some of you go, big kiss to heaven. That's what I used to do in Sunday school. I used to teach the kids because they didn't know how to, to worship God. I said, okay, just. <laughs> and all these kids would be like in worship going, mwah, mwah, mwah. and it was so beautiful and um that that intimate worship of god but see how it changes the atmosphere yeah. that's a byproduct don't do it for that but this is how you pray this is how you pray this is how you get revelation this is how you change the atmosphere over your household this is how you become a successful leader in your workplace. This is how you get revelation for your family. This is how you know how to pray when you don't know what the solution is. Cool? Love you. Thank you. God bless you. Good night.